Turn, if you would, in your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. I'd like to go to the end of this chapter, beginning in verse number 41, as our text for the message this morning, Acts chapter 2, and beginning in verse number 41, and we'll read down to verse number 47. So as I read these words, I'd appreciate if you would follow along and see what the Word of God has to say. Acts chapter 2 and verse number 41, the Bible says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they, continuing daily, with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and signalness of heart praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless the preaching of his word this morning. Our Father, as we bow in your presence, we're thankful for the privilege that we have, not only to assemble in this place, but also to hold in our hands the precious word of God. Lord, I do pray that this morning as the bread of life is broken, that our hearts would be open to receive that which you have for us as a church, for individuals, that, Lord, we may not only see your will revealed to us, but, Lord, that we would do your will and be doers of the word. I pray that you would guide and direct us, and, Lord, on this special day, that you would uh, empower our church, Lord, to continue to be faithful to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, and to, I think, to some degree this evening, the purpose I have is to present the vision and the theme for our church for the coming year. Uh, This is what we refer to as our Vision Sunday. And uh, a year ago, uh, I stood and presented the vision for 2020, and it was a 2020 vision taken from Acts chapter 20 and verse number 20. And so as we face a new year here in just a couple of weeks, I want to uh, present to our church the emphasis that we'll have for, for the coming year. And this emphasis is taken from the text that I just read, and in particular verse number 42. If you look at verse number 42, the Bible says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And in particular, the phrase there, continued steadfastly. I believe that that is to be the theme that we have as a church, a reminder that come what may this coming year, uh, we will all strive to continue and to do so steadfastly. Certainly it has been said, I think, to the point of ad nauseum, that this has been a very difficult and a very unusual year. I think we're getting tired of hearing that. We hear it from government officials telling us uh, how things are and how bad things are and so forth. We hear it all the time from the media. I think most of the prayer letters that we've read from our evangelists over the last several months have all mentioned how it has affected their ministry many of them being unable to go back to the field of service or many of them remaining on the field of service and unable to uh, to get back to their home churches here in this country and uh, i think to a man they say it has been a very difficult and an unusual year and among ourselves here in this church it has been a tough time Uh, we've seen the pandemic uh, all around us it has affected some in the church, and uh, we're just rejoicing today for uh, what God has done in answering our prayers on behalf of Brother Ferris. But it has been a very difficult year, and as I stood here a year ago and presented the theme, of course, that was the furthest thing from anyone's mind that we would face uh, this kind of a 
situation in our country. But in reading this text of scripture and presenting it as the thought and the theme and the emphasis for our coming year, I was reminded that uh, we are just in a situation here in the first century where uh, the gospel has gone forth and God has continued to do a great work. Uh, this chapter number two describes the aftermath of the feast day, the Jewish feast day of Pentecost. And it had been 10 days since the resurrected Lord, Jesus Christ, had ascended back to heaven. He had left his church there and for those 10 days of waiting, the church was uh, surviving on a prayer and a promise that they had. But on the day of Pentecost, which was in the month of June in the year 30, on this particular occasion, the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ was fulfilled because he sent down from heaven the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost was sent down from heaven and a number of great and mighty things took place. But one of those is that that church, that assembly of baptized believers who were gathered there in the upper room, who were praying for 10 days and waiting on the Lord, that the Holy Spirit enveloped that church. Jesus said, I will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And that's exactly what happened. The Spirit of God just immersed that church there uh, in his person and in his power. And to me that was encouraging because 120 believers there assembled in that upper room is not a whole lot different from the size of Bible Baptist Church here in Oak Harbor on a good day. And of course we've seen our numbers uh, uh, vary over the last several months, but the church that was roughly the size of our church was empowered by the Spirit of God and was able to begin fulfilling the Great Commission of our Lord Jesus Christ. You'll remember back in chapter 1, Jesus said before he went to heaven, in verse number 8 he said, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And that happened. And here in chapter number two, we find that Peter is standing there with the 11 other apostles. They were preaching to the crowds that had gathered there in Jerusalem, crowds of people who had come from not only the immediate area, but from all over the world, so to speak, for the festival of Pentecost. And Peter stood there and he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. In verse 26 of chapter Number two, he said, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. And if you read through that whole sermon, you'll find that he preached the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he had died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, and uh, that uh, in Jesus Christ, we can have salvation. In fact, later on, Peter would preach uh, that there is none other name under heaven whereby we must be saved, the name of Jesus Christ. And as he preached the gospel, the Spirit of God, who was working through the preaching of the Word of God, began to convict people. There was great Holy Spirit conviction. In chapter 2, here in verse number 37, the Bible says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. God was working in their heart. God was revealing to them their sinfulness. He was showing these righteous, self-righteous Jews that uh, all of their righteousnesses were as filthy rags in the sight of God. And they were convicted that they were guilty sinners uh, who were deserving of all the judgment of hell for their sins. They were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do? That's the greatest question you can ask, my friend. What do I have to do to be saved? And so Peter gave them an answer. He said, you need to repent. You need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then after you've been saved, you need to be baptized and show what has taken place in your life. 
And he said in verse 39, the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And so this was a great day of preaching. And the outcome we see in verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now we use this verse of scripture a lot around here, and it's a very familiar verse. And the reason we do that is because it gives to us very clearly the divine order or God's plan for man. You see, first of all, there must be salvation. You can't put this out of order. Then they that gladly received his word. The Bible says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so in order to be saved, we have to hear what God says about Jesus Christ, about our sin, about salvation. And when we hear that and we believe the gospel, then we are born again. So the first step and the first part of God's plan for your life and for my life is that we would be saved. They gladly received his word. Getting saved is a glad thing. It's not a sorrowful thing. They gladly received his word. And secondly, they were baptized. Baptism is not part of salvation, but it follows salvation. And consistently throughout the New Testament, you will find that people are saved and then they are baptized. This is a command of the Lord given in the Great Commission to make disciples and to baptize those who believe and then to teach them all things. And so we find that baptism, which follows salvation, is the divinely appointed way of identifying ourselves with Jesus Christ. When we go down under the water, we are picturing his death. And when we come up out of the water, we are picturing his resurrection. We are saying to the world, that I am a follower of Jesus Christ and I identify my life with his life and his life is in me and the life that I now live, it is Christ living in me and I have that resurrected life of Christ that's living through my life now from, and I want the world to know. But you'll also notice that not only were they baptized but the same day that baptism added them to the church they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And so we see from the Bible, we believe the scriptures teach that in order to be a member of Bible Baptist Church, you need to be saved and scripturally baptized in that order. And uh, so baptism is the means of adding you to the body of believers that makes up the New Testament church in this particular location. And membership in a scriptural New Testament church, by the way, is God's plan for your life. I realize that we live in a, a world and in, in a country where there's a lot of what I call take it or leave it Christianity, where people have it in their mind that they will do what they think they want to do, not necessarily what God's word says we need to do. But God's word is very clear and very consistent. Salvation baptism and church membership. And, uh, you know, people have this idea also, I think sometimes, that if I get saved, it, it will make my life better or it will make my life easier. And, uh, you know, that's not always the case. Uh, certainly, the promise of the life to come is way better. It is glorious to know that whatever happens in this life we have an eternity awaiting us that is so wonderful and so glorious that human language is insufficient to describe it. That's what awaits us. And uh, certainly as a Christian, we have a much better future than someone who has not trusted Christ. But you know, in this life, uh, the gospel and salvation uh, may not promise us a, a better life in the sense of an easier life or a more healthy life. Uh, but what the gospel does give to us is the, equip, the equipping for whatever comes in life. That whatever the Lord will take you through as a Christian, 
whether it's a trial or whether it's a joy, God will equip you through the word of God as one of his children in how to deal with that and how to go through that. But an easier life, not always the case, not necessarily uh, is that the case. And here in this verse or this passage of scripture, I want you to look down to verse number 44 and maybe this will demonstrate what I'm trying to get, convey here at this point. In verse number 44, the Bible says, and all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And so the thought occurred to me and maybe to you also that what, why was it that they had to, uh, that some people needed to sell up and help out others with, uh, with financial gifts or food gifts or whatever the need was to take care of them? And could it be that when many of those who uh, trusted Christ and became Christians, became followers of Jesus Christ, that they suffered loss for their testimony? when they were baptized. There are places in the world today where baptism is, <laughs> it, it is something that is likely to radically change your life from a human point of view. There are places in the world when someone is baptized, they are disowned by their family. Uh, where in certain countries, you are marked for death if they can catch up with you and, and kill you. Because baptism, signifies that I am now following Jesus Christ. Now, it's not the case here in this country, and that could be a good thing or a, not a good thing, depending on how you look at it. But I wonder here in Jerusalem, the center of the Jewish religion, which is dominated by these religious leaders who uh, despise Jesus Christ, and to have 3,000 people getting baptized on that one day, if many of them went to work the next morning and were told by their bosses, because you're a Christian, you no longer have a job. Or they went back to their homes and were put out of the home. Mom and dad say, we don't want you to be here if you're going to be a Christian. I don't know, I'm just surmising, but it seems to me that there were some hard times that had come that necessitated those believers in that church to even sell up some of their goods to provide for those who were without. And that would be in keeping with what our Lord taught us. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Now that's a, a, a drastic uh, thing, and sometimes it's happened to people who have been in this church that their family has virtually disowned them because they come and attend this church and are part of this church, but for most of us that's not the case. But it was here, I believe, and there was hardship. We are not called upon to suffer in that way in this country, at least yet, although it has been a tough year. There's been sadness, there's been frustration. Some of you have lost loved ones, and certainly we've all had to deal with the COVID-19 restrictions. So we can understand a little bit, perhaps, of what it might have been like in the first century. The question really is not what happened to them, but how did the church at Jerusalem handle the problems that, were, that the members were facing? Well, the answer is simple. In verse 42, they continued steadfastly. They continued steadfastly. In other words, they did not quit. They did not hunker in their bunker but they continued. And that word continued means that they were moving onward and they were steadfast, meaning that there was no change. They did not say, well, because of the fact that my family is upset with me, I'll sort of not bring up this doctrine or I'll not believe this doctrine. No, they were continuing steadfastly even through 
the hard times. They kept on assembling. They kept preaching and advancing the gospel. And they continued to keep trusting in the Lord. In fact, if you read through the first eight chapters of the book of Acts, which primarily deals with the history of this church there in Jerusalem, you'll see that they accomplished some wonderful things. They had a tremendous testimony. Yes, they had problems on the outside. They had problems within the church. But they continued steadfastly doing what the Lord had called them to do. Now, brethren, as much as we all want it to happen, I think COVID-19 is not going to suddenly go away on January the 1st of 2021. In fact, no one can really say, I think, how far into this coming year it's going to be around. We just don't know. And certainly when it comes to preparing a plan for the coming year and some of the events that we're accustomed to as a church, uh, all we can do is have a wish list and basically say, well, if conditions allow, we'd like to do this and that on certain months and so forth. But the one thing that we can do and the one thing that we must do is to continue steadfast, not to fall by the wayside, not to, to uh, withdraw and, uh, and become introverted, but even through whatever hardships we may pass to go forward for the Lord Jesus Christ. And here in this passage, I see five areas in which we are to continue steadfastly. Now, for the sake of time, I'm going to divide this message and I'll finish it tonight. But I want to talk about the first of these at least, and that is in verse 42. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Brethren, that is so important for us to understand. You see, every Christian is to grow spiritually. Even in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 2, the Bible says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may be able to grow thereby. So as a Christian, our spiritual food is the word of God. We take it as milk and eventually we get into the strong meat. But right from the beginning, whether you've been saved just a short while or you've been saved for a long while, we need the spiritual food and we need to grow spiritually. In fact, this is more than just eating spiritually and, and growing in that sense, but Peter later wrote in his second epistle in chapter number three, listen to what he said in verses 17 and 18. He said, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware, that's a warning, beware lest ye also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Now, Peter was writing years later after the events that we have here in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. In fact, it was right toward the end of his life in somewhere around 68 AD, about then, so 30 plus years later. And he's writing to those Christians and he's saying, listen, you need to beware. There are false doctrines out there. There are evil uh, uh, wolves in sheep's clothing, false teachers who will lead you astray. And so you need to continue steadfastly or what will happen is you're likely to fall from your own steadfastness. You know, that's one of the concerns we have with the current conditions and we do understand that there are those who are unable to attend or feel it's unwise for them to attend publicly but it does present the possibility of a spiritual danger because the bible instructs us on two things here in, in verse number 47 first of all the bible tells us what in in what we are to grow we are to grow in the apostles doctrine all right? And that's important because the Apostles' Doctrine is, is the doctrine that we need to follow. Uh, in the same epistle, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, Peter wrote these words, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up 
your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles, of our Lord and Saviour. When the Bible says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, you can translate that as the New Testament because the New Testament is the words of the apostles and prophets of Jesus Christ. And we are not to go outside the Bible for our doctrine. We're not to, to, to look for it in other uh, avenues, but simply to be steadfast and to continue in the doctrines of the word of God. And that is the doctrine, that is the truth that was once and for all, by the way, delivered unto the saints. God has given us everything we have and need in this Bible. The, the word of God tells us that. Even in Second Peter, he said that he's given us all things that pertain unto godliness and life. And what we need in this life, you've got it here in the Bible. So as we go forward into 2021, we need to be steadfastly continuing in the apostles' doctrine. But that doesn't stop there. Notice it says there in verse 42, I should say, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. There's no comma separating those in the uh, apostles' doctrine and fellowship. So the Bible instructs us in what we are to grow, but it also instructs us as to where we are to grow. The fellowship, the apostles' fellowship. What do you think the apostles' fellowship is? Well, I know at this time it was simply going to church. At that time, the apostles were alive. There are no apostles today in person, although we have their words recorded for us in the Bible. And in those days, to continue in the apostles' fellowship was to fellowship, be together where the apostles were, and they were gathered together in the assembly that is known as the Lord's Church. What I'm simply trying to say is that in 2021, we need to strive to continue steadfastly in church attendance. And I know it's not always possible in these uh, trying times, but we ought to, uh, we ought to make every effort that uh, is reasonable for sure. You see, we cannot overemphasize the importance of faithful church attendance. Unless you are providentially hindered, you need to be here. You say, well, I don't need church all the time. Well, you'd be surprised. But remember that the Bible says the church is the pillar and ground of the truth doesn't say that of the internet or some other radio or TV preacher. It says the church, the assembly. It's the Lord's institution. You know, it's, it, it, you could uh, illustrate it by thinking of it in terms of our human families. And uh, we who have children in our home especially, we expect them to be in the home. We don't expect them just to wander all over and go to wherever, whatever home or family that they feel like they want to uh, settle down with for a period of time and wander all over the place? No, we want them in the home because there's a purpose for that. And the church is the Lord's institution. And not only that, but the Bible teaches that God has gifted, Jesus Christ has gifted to every New Testament church pastors and teachers. And that's not just to stand up here and, and fill in time every Sunday or however that works. The reason is given in Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 12 through 14 that pastors and teachers are given for the perfecting of the saints. That is the maturing of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. I think more than ever with the, uh, the information and the technological age in which we find ourselves, there are so many voices out there that are bidding for our listening time that we need to steadfastly continue in the apostles' fellowship, as well as the apostles' doctrine. And in these 
def- difficult times, I trust that we will desire and plan to do that. The Bible makes no provision for what I call maverick Christians, you know, just wandering around, going from place to place. Well, we'll leave it at this point here this morning. Uh, I want to talk about some of the other things that we find here from verse number 42 where it speaks of the breaking of bread, uh, continuing steadfastly in that. What does that refer to? The prayers, continuing steadfastly in prayers, verse 42, and then in charity, and then in soul winning. These are areas that are in many ways the basics of Christian living and church life and I think that as we enter into this coming year of 2021, the government may tell us that we have to close down. They may say, as we hear, get used to the new normal. But my friends, we are nowhere near experiencing the hardships of first century Christians. They were admonished to remain continuing steadfast. And that will be my challenge not only this morning but this evening, that we would indeed remain steadfastly or continuing steadfastly in the faith.